Well, thank you all for um, joining us uh, here today for this uh, exciting, uh, exciting event. I had an opportunity to a much smaller crowd this morning um, to uh, provide some remarks and just to paraphrase about 10 minutes because I don't want to cut into our speaker's time. Um, you know, to me, as I think hopefully many of you know, research and education are about excellence and how to drive clinical excellence. And that's why I'm just so thrilled to see us again now in our 20th uh, consecutive research day, uh, really focus on the kinds of things that we're focusing on. Because, you know, clinical excellence is the core to our strategy of being this trusted network of caring. So thank you all for your participation and uh, thank you for the work that you do. So uh, when, when uh, Dr. Schwarzmiller uh, approached me um, about a speaker for this important event, it was pretty easy for me to say, well, my good friend and colleague from Johns Hopkins, Dr. Peter Pronovos, would be perfect for this. And thank you, Peter, for taking the time to be with us uh, today. You all have uh, Peter's bio in front of you, and, and you can clearly see you know, how accomplished he is and why he is such a sought-after speaker. But um, I'm not going to do the traditional read his bio and tell you all the wonderful things about him because um, those are pretty evident. But um, I want to tell you why I wanted him here today. You see, I actually know Peter pretty well <laughs> and uh, understand what's behind the bio. Um, so let me spend a, just a couple of minutes introducing the guy that I've known for over a decade. Um, and so here it goes. So Peter is, <laughs> yeah, I've got other stories about Peter, but I won't tell them. Um, you know, first and foremost, um, Peter is a kind and honest person. And that's important in the work that he's undertaken and that we all care deeply about. Peter also cares deeply about people his patients, and he's still a practicing physician. Lou, you were just speaking with him uh, about that. His students, his colleagues, and most importantly, his family and his friends. And I know his family. Um, and um, at Hopkins, we had a lot of mutual friends. And Peter is on a mission to improve care and safety for patients throughout the world. And I know that this passion comes from within him. They're about his personal experiences, not just as a physician, but as a son. He's also a, a naturally born leader, incredibly visionary. He's very convincing. He's inclusive. He's savvy, and you have to be to survive in the world that we were in, that you're in, I was in. And most importantly, he's very, very, very persistent. So let me discuss the persistent part. So I view the work of improving quality and safety as an ultra marathon through the mountains. And oftentimes, I don't know this from personal experience, I know this through my daughter. Um, oftentimes, the course is unmarked and it's strewn with seemingly unmovable barriers and switchbacks. And occasionally, a wild animal comes out. And it's particularly difficult when you're at an academic institution, and I know that some of you have heard me use this phrase before, where the thousand points of no can derail the best of intentions. But somehow, Peter persists. He finds a way. He includes and engages frontline staff. Therefore, the change really emerges both from the bedside and from the boardroom. 
what he has done to change the conversation around quality and safety in this country and throughout the world, as well as his own Johns Hopkins, is nothing short of genius. And so it is my absolute honor and pleasure to have my good friend Peter here to join the podium. Thank you. Brian, thank you for those kind uh, words. I apologize. I normally wouldn't stand behind the podium, but they're filming or they're broadcasting it, so you have to see me in a box. Uh, you uh, have a real win with Brian coming here. It's a, a loss, and I'm very confident in saying we're a poor organization because we uh, no longer have Brian, so congrats. No, humility is perhaps the most important value for improvement because without it we can't make any progress and yet it's a value that I think is too rare in medicine perhaps not here but certainly where I work. I'll share with you after Brian's uh, overly generous introduction a story of how I'm uh, often and, and easily humbled, not just by my 16-year-old daughter who has an uncanny ability to do that, but I was giving a talk, I don't know, maybe six months ago or so, and I was on call the night before in the ICU, and I probably looked like I was on call, and I left early to go to the airport, and I had a pretty tight schedule, and they had a driver waiting for me, a distinguished gentleman in a tuxedo, about 60, with a sign that says Dr. Pronovost, and so I get off the plane and said, oh, Okay, sir, let's go. I'm going to be late. I got a tight schedule. And he says, Oh, no, Sonny. I'm waiting for a famous Johns Hopkins doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I said, Okay, can I like, go for along with the ride with you? <clears throat> now, today we're going to talk about implementation science research, but the overarching arc that I want us to talk about and reflect on is the stories we tell ourselves. Stories. You see, stories are the most powerful force for change in the world. They either pin us to our current performance or they propel us to new pinnacles because stories define how we act in the world. You change the story and you change everything. Stories like JFK, I want a man on the moon. Story of Martin Luther King, nonviolence protest. Story of Reagan, tear down that wall. You get the courage to tell that new story, and they're powerful. And right now, we have some dysfunctional stories, I think, that are holding us back in our journey. Dysfunctional stories. Stories that patients in patient and safety and quality are somehow victims rather than co-creators of their care. Stories that harm is, is inevitable rather than preventable. A story that safety and quality is based on the heroism of our clinicians rather than the design of safe systems. And perhaps most pervasively, stories that we're going to solve this healthcare quality and safety problem by regulation and payment reform. Because the data is pretty overwhelming that changing the incentives for finance impacts the quantity of care we give, but it does preciously little for the quality of care we give. You, we define the quality of, of care we give, and that's our responsibility. And so anytime I get a chance to speak with clinicians and leaders of healthcare systems, I'm delighted because we are the ones who have to solve this problem. And it's <clears throat> a big problem, a little bit of context, what we know. Right now, Sadly, we don't really know how many people suffer harm needlessly, but the estimates are it's somewhere between the third and the sixth leading cause of death in th this, this country. The sad indictment, though, is that statement that we don't really know 15 years into this. Right now, somewhere between one in three and oftentimes two in I mean, five and ten patients leave their health care encounter saying, I was disrespected. I wasn't listened to. And this is national HCAP data, and suspect in your house system and mine. And right now, we squander a third of every dollar that we spend on health care <clears throat> that doesn't get patient well. To put that into context, so you, it's 
a trillion dollars, it's almost un, uh, unconscionable. That turns out to be about $10,000 per household in America. Folks, that's the median net worth of the people we serve in East Baltimore who you saw on the news for that civil unrest, right? And so that's dollars that could be far better used for STEM, for preschool education, for jobs training, for economic growth. And so this idea of getting the health care reform right isn't just nice for health care. It's frankly the future of the American dream, and it's what our responsibility is. So today's discussion is going to be how research drives us that, at least uh, perhaps a different idea of research. So we're, we're going to explore a bit about what is implementation science, this new type of research, use a case study to explore it, and then share with you some of the newer stuff we're using to apply it within our, our health system. And we'll have pl plenty of times uh, for questions. But I'd like you, as we start this, to either write down or reflect on the words, I will. I will. You see, these sessions aren't just about getting together and sharing and hearing kind words from Brian. They're about doing something when you leave here. And so at the end of the session, we'll ask you to think about how you might complete your I will statements. And if any of you are ha want to, I'm happy to have you email me your I will statements letter because this stuff matters. Now, our science has never been more breathtaking. <coughs> how breathtaking? Well, we can now print uh, artificial limbs using a 3D printer, right? And high school kids are doing these things. It's just amazing what we're doing. We're growing or or organs. You're the posters that you had out there for your research day are just absolutely breathtaking. And yet, in the midst of that, we have to reconcile that harm may be the third leading cause of death, that patients are just respectful. And what it suggests is that, yes, biomedical discovery has been fantastic, but it has a problem that we may not be solving. And what we know from psychology and social psych and anthropology is that in any time we try to solve a problem, there's the problem itself, but then there's the problem of human perception that place limits on our potential. And that, my folks, is our story of research. You see, our research model in this country and around the world grew out of a report in 1942, this may be something you're not aware of, by Vannevar Bush that uh, President Roosevelt asked him to write. It's titled The Great Frontier. And in it, he describes what we all do now is this little linear model of science, that science goes from basic research, some of your projects you had out there, to clinical, to sometimes applied research. Very, very lin linear model. The surprising thing was, there was essentially no evidence to support that model. And indeed, if you look where great breakthroughs have come from in science, none of them, none of them use that model. They use the model, rather, of combining applied and basic research together, of not just solving puzzles, but of solving problems. Think, perhaps, an example of the moonshot. Right? The moonshot was lazily focused, I want a man on the moon and back in 10 years. And what came out of that? CT scanners, the soles of our uh, running shoes, smoke detectors in your home. I mean, amazing amount of technology, but it was bringing basic and diverse researchers to solve a problem. Perhaps the best example of this is right here in your own state is Bell Labs. I had the great fortune to have dinner with Gordon Moore. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation supports some of our research. And in it, he's, you know, in his mid-80s, he described the history of Silicon Valley, but his time at Bell Labs. And it was just breathtaking. He describes how we brought diverse scientists together, lazily focused on our problems, right, with this humble c culture, but committed to making things better, and then how those ideas left Bell Labs to go out to Silicon Valley, first in Fairchild's uh, company, then to Shockley's, and how basically Silicon Valley and venture capitalists all got populated by this combined focused efforts. And that's, folks, what I think we need to do more of. Because you see, the great ideas that we're going to have in science 
don't come from within disciplines. They come from the intersections of disciplines, of drawing upon what I call transdisciplinary re research. And let me frame what we mean by that. Many of us talk about interdisciplinary research or interdisciplinary practice. The idea with that is you bring different disciplines together to solve a problem, but we each stay in our own mental model. So if I'm a system engineer, I think system engineer level. If I'm an economist, I think economic level. If I'm an epidemiologist or a statistician, I do epi. And if I'm a nurse or a pharmacist, I think that model. Transdisciplinary research differs fundamentally from that in saying we bring different disciplines together to solve a problem through an integrated conceptual model. That is, we mash up these different ideas align them so that you can pull many levers to move the needle in a much, much bigger way. Now, the challenge with that is we don't train people to do transdisciplinary research. The basic model of research that we train people in is to what we would call is to be a T. That is, I have very deep methodological grounding in something, right? In, in oncology or critical care or epi, and I know almost nothing about anything else. And what we need to do is start to produce jellyfish. And what I mean by that is you need one long tentacle with methodological grounding. It's science matters. But you need to be humble and curious enough to develop many short tentacles so you know how to pull those other levers to move this needle. Right? It's a very, very different way of approaching research. So I'm not a system engineer or a human factors engineer <clears throat> or a sociologist or an anthropologist, but I know enough to say, how can I pull those levers or bring those experts in to drive this needle or a behavioral economist to begin to do this? So I could even have a conversation with those experts to move from them. Because if you don't have those short tentacles, we talk past each other, right? We never get the ability to, to, to do that. So what what is implementation science then with this context of transdisciplinary research? Well, it really was informed, as I was speaking with earlier, by this thinking from systems engineering to say it starts with the end in mind. Right? Very, very different mindset of most research is A better than B. Do I want Coke or Pepsi? That research is important, but you get to a point where you have enough evidence that the goal has to flip to I want to eliminate infections, and I'm going to package a program that allows me to do that, and I'm going to have leadership issues and basic science issues, and I'm going to move the, the, the needles. Uh, implementation science requires a clear partnership by many researchers and providers. You can't do this research if you're not collaborative. Right? And we see this all over the place in my organization where we have brilliant researchers, but it can't scale because it's not practical in the real world in, in the real world practice, or they haven't partnered with clinicians, and it has to be integrated and respect the wisdom of frontline cl uh, clinicians. <clears throat> it draws upon theories, both theories large and small, and this is perhaps one of the biggest gaps we have in implement implementation science, and, and Brian will well remember many discussions. I'll, I'll give you this idea of what we mean by th theories. Theories, not this uh, ethereal idea, it simply says, if I have an idea that doing X is going to lead to a better outcome, what assumptions am I making about that? What has to happen? And, and could I literally draw a figure of how doing this will lead to a better outcome? So classic example of childhood obesity is a big problem, so we're going to replace candy with, with fruits and vegetables in a vending machine, right? Great idea, but there's a whole lot of assumptions that have to happen before that solves the problem. We, I believe, as a country, fell victim of this with our implementation of EHRs, and mine is in Epic, right? Spending over a billion dollars, we all believed it's going to save us money, productivity is going up. But when you said, okay, could you write down your assumptions of what has to happen between sticking this EMR in and getting better outcomes on the end? There are a whole lot of assumptions about using decision support tools, about getting data out that weren't budgeted at all that clinicians are going to buy into, and we wonder why we're not seeing the r results that, that we have. So being mindful of when you do things, what assumptions am I making about how doing this uh, will <clears throat> lead to better outcomes? It's inherently transdisciplinary and multifaceted. 
And now my research colleagues cringe at this because often you want to be able to say, was A better than B? Did doing this make an outcome? In implementation science research, I give up on that. Okay? Unless a component of the intervention is costly or risky, the time to know that one component matters isn't worth it. So in, in my work, I was criticized highly to say, Peter, you had a five-point checklist. Could it have been four? Could it have been three? I said, sure, it could have been three or four, but these infections kill as many people as breast cancer every year. It would have taken me eight years to test whether it's four or five, and it's a 30-second greater time to do it. Is it really worth finding that out? No, we're going to go with sound theory, and, and we're going to test it, but it's a different way of thinking. You have to give up this idea of knowing which component and trusting that I'm going to package a multifaceted component. Implementation science evolves over time. Again, those who do more clinical research are very used to writing a set protocol that stays static and that's what you approve. Implementation science is messy. It needs to evolve and reflect how clinicians learn, what they're doing. You have to p pivot and change or else you, you, it will n never work. And importantly, it needs mixed methods. And this is an area that I think we've undervalued. You see, the traditional quantitative research, research that I'm trained in, often answers whether something worked. But the magic, if you want to scale it across your system, if you want to scale it across the word, world, isn't just whether it works, it's knowing how and why it works. In basic research, that's called understanding the mechanism. In implementation science, it's understanding culture and people and incentives and how they get by. And, and that's our social science colleagues to say, how do you get people inspired through this? How do you leverage it, uh, inspiration rather than coercion? Because we know doing things to people rather than with them isn't going to, to work. So with that background, <clears throat> I'd like to share briefly an implementation science project that I was part of, that your health system was part of, that Lou uh, was part of, that we worked on. And like so many of our projects, it begins with a story of personal shortcomings. You see, in 2001, in Baltimore, on a snowy night, in a dark corner of the ICU, this little girl, Josie King, was taken off of life support and died in her mother's arms. She had been burned and the clinicians saved her, but a central line infection sacrificed her. Now, these infections didn't get a lot of attention, but they're not some rare condition. At the time, they killed more people than breast or prostate cancer. So just put, that's the public health impact that we're talking about, not some trivial thing. But at the time, myself included, we've all been taught that these harms are inevitable. That when you care for sick or old or young people or you do big operations, sometimes little girls like Josie are going to die. And there's nothing you can do about it. Well, after she died, her mother Sorel came to us and said, Peter, could you tell me that this won't happen to my other daughters? She was worried about them suffering the same fate, and I said, no, I can't. And at the time, I was one of those doctors causing infections. I, I didn't want to. No clinician does, but I was. But then she looked me in the eye and has that humbling gaze that a mother who's lost a child has the unique ability to and said, Peter, I want to know what you personally are going to do about it. And in that moment, I got convinced that she deserves an answer. So we started to get to work. And what did we do? Well, number one, we started by declaring a goal of zero infections and, and committing to doing that. And my colleagues at the time thought we were crazy. Intensivists at the time thought we were crazy. We created a checklist of best practices and made it easy to comply with the checklist. We got doctors and nurses to work together through a program called CUSP and encouraged nurses to speak up and question if the doctors didn't follow the checklist. We investigated every infection and saw where we had shortcomings. We fed data on infections back into the system, transparently reported, and hold clinicians accountable for that. And now 
through the efforts of a whole lot of people, these infections weren't just down at Hopkins, but we spread it across the country, state by state, nurse learning from nurse, doctor learning from doctor, hospital executive learning from a hospital. And it's probably the only example of post to er is human compared to pre to er is human, an 80% reduction in these infections across the US in all hospitals. And your hospital is one of them. I mean, again, this is, think curing a public health problem of the size of breast cancer or prostate cancer. It's remarkable what happened. But when we dug into it to say, okay, there's something magical here, I think it's deeper than the checklist. The checklist is important, but we need to find out what the secret sauce is. What we found out was it was much deeper. Our anthropologist and sociologist interviewed clinicians and said, what really made the difference here? And when you spoke to them, you can see in their eyes what they believed in their heart. They started this work telling the story that these infections are inevitable, that sometimes little girls like Josie are going to die, and there's nothing you can do about it. And when they told themselves a new story that harm is, is preventable and I am empowered to do something about it, the checklist was irrelevant. They figured it out. They're smart enough to do it. It was that belief that drove it. And so we dug deeper and said, what leads to that different belief system? Because if you can tap into that, boy, you have a gold mine. And what we found was that belief system was really driven by two things. Number one, that somebody believed in the clinicians that they could. An executive a leader, a board member, declared a goal of zero infections. Now, could we really get to zero infections? No, things are going to happen. But if that board member doesn't believe, just like Kennedy told a story, we will put a man on the moon in 10 years, the staff never believed him. Right? Nothing is more disheartening when I'm looking at our HCAP scores and one of our presidents says, but you know, Peter, our patients are rich. Our patients are poor. We have double rooms. Because what your staff hear is you don't believe they're capable of doing it. And that's not at all to say those things aren't things we got to manage. Yes, it makes it harder. But I believe that healthcare has the best workers and they could figure out how to do that. The second thing that changed their stories was that they belong together. That as they started connecting peer learning communities, what we call clinical communities, not driven by pay for performance or external regulation, but by doctor and nurse learning from doctor and nurse from one hospital learning from another. So I would say, wow, Lou, your rates are down really good. What is it you're doing that I could do better? And through that, we became empowered and we changed our peer norms to, to, to doing that. So let's now go back up on the leads and say, okay, if this is one of the few national examples of a success story, why did it work at a policy level? What do policymakers, because many of you play at that level or at a state level, what could we learn? And these are some of my colleagues at HHS and CDC and ARC published. Well, first, you need, we had a valid measurement system, right? And that's really key. There's very few harms that we have valid data that are worth their weight in salt, and we need to absolutely get that. We had great evidence for the research practices that lead to improved infections. Research practices like you did out here, so keep these research going. We need to find out what works. We had investment in improvement science. Early on, AHRQ gave us a grant to figure out how do you package these programs in a scalable way? How do you get teams to work together? How do you create a culture where nurses might question doctors? And through that early investment, we then scaled a, a, a program. It was driven by local communities. Right? This wasn't imposed on people. Uh, a matter of fact, when we first did this, I'll sh share a story with you. Our researchers said, okay, we need one checklist, much like you might see the WHO did their surgical checklist to drive infection rates. And I said, no, absolutely not. If we do that, no one's gonna buy into it. Nobody wants to use the Johns Hopkins checklist. Right, that, well, they'll get antibodies to it. My researcher said, no, Peter, you'll never know what they really do. They, how are you gonna ever publish this? And I said, no, no, we'll make the key five principles that they need to do, but let's encourage everyone to make their own. So there's two or 3,000 hospitals that did this program, and there's 3,000 versions of the checklist. Now, they're 90 to 95% the same, 
but that 5% difference makes it work. And every one of them thinks theirs is the best, and it is for their culture and their context. It would never work. So there's no Johns Hopkins checklist, and nobody called this the Johns Hopkins program or the, the Peter program. It is the, you know, St. Mary's Hospitals has their program, and they own it, and they need to own it because it won't work. Because what underlies all of this is this deep belief that change progresses at the speed of trust. And all this work is about human building, trusting relationships. Finally, the last policy lever that we did was we aligned many federal agencies around one common goal and measure. Now, this was perhaps the hardest piece. Many of you may have saw the hospital engagement networks and the CMS's partnership for patients. You may not know, in that effort, they reported five, literally five different measures for bloodstream infections, and their performance among them very five-fold. Five-fold, and so how do you know which one is right? In this effort, what did we do is we worked with CDC and ARC and CMS and said, can't have that. CDC's measures are the most valid. Laser, that's what we're going to use. A line around it. You pull your own levers in this transdisciplinary thing. So state health departments do what you need to do, and CDC do what you need to do. ARC, but message one measure because you're going to confuse the hell out of people given five different measures. And, and that's a policy lever that we don't pull anywhere enough. We then got curious and said, why did this work at a local level? You see, again, the checklist story was way too simple. And most of the implementation science work has been focused on that microsystem level. What is the ICU doctor and nurse? But we knew that's not right. Leadership matters. The quality improvement department matters. So what we found is there was four key steps and three different teams that had to be engaged in this. Number one, senior leaders need to declare and communicate a goal of zero infections. Let me just take a step back and tell you how we found out these things. And some of the hospitals in New Jersey were part of this. We borrowed a technique from the nuclear industry called peer-to-peer -peer review, where one nuclear facility goes into another nuclear facility to see what they can learn and they don't have any regulatory authority. It's anonymous, but it's ruthlessly honest. And we went in, Brian was part of this at his hospital, and went in and said, let's see what differentiates hospitals with zero clapsy and not zero clapsy to see if we could find some themes. And so we went into about 30 hospitals. We started at our systems. And what we found is it was entirely predictable who was zero entirely predictable and it wasn't just a checklist and this is where we got this model so in that view we went in and we interviewed infection prevention staff we interviewed the ceos we interviewed a board we interviewed icu nurse managers and then we just walked around the icu confidentially asking nurses or doctors you know could they feel comfortable speaking up to get a culture so you go into a hospital if i went in and asked Brian what his goal for infection is. Brian would say, did say, my goal is zero clabsy, and I communicated to all my staff, and it's messaged at orientation. Wasn't surprising he had gone a long time without an infection. If I went into the CEO and said, what's your goal for infection? And they said, you know, I think it's to be low, but we got this one, Peter, we're pretty good on it. I said, okay, okay, I, I get you're pretty good. But do you know what your performance is? Now, you know, talk to my infection prevention staff, but I think we're doing pretty good. Guaranteed they weren't zero, right? The ones that were zero were intentional about messaging and declaring a goal. Second is they created an enabling infrastructure to support the work. That's what we often call a coordinating team. It took many forms. It was the infection prevention staff. It was the chief medical officer. It was in quality improvement. But somebody made it easy to support the work of frontline clinicians. W what did that coordinating team do? Well, typically four things. They provided project management for the work. They provided data and feedback. They provided improvement science or implementation science. And they developed the training materials that were needed to, to, to drive this work. The third thing was that they engaged frontline clinicians and helped connected them in peer learning communities. If we went into a health system and the infection prevention people were the ones who say, this is my problem, I own it, they were guaranteed not zero. 
They were zero when the ICU nurse manager or the ICU director said, this is my problem. I work with infection prevention. They're the technical experts, but it's locally owned. I have accountability every day. That drove uh, in infection. And so that's local improvement teams. And then finally, they transparently reported and they had accountability. That is, if you missed your mark, somebody looked at it and asked why. We'll, we'll go into a little bit more. But that model is a model that you'll see we, we can use more broadly. Now, at the bedside level, we also had our simple theory. This is a model that we published about how to translate research into practice. And it quite simply says, whatever problem you're trying to solve, we first need to summarize the evidence into an unambiguous checklist of behaviors. Right? Be very, very behaviorally specific. What is it that I need to do? Second is we need to identify barriers to doing those behaviors. And so often we make the assumption that the only barrier is knowledge. So we send out education materials or emails thinking that that's the only barrier. But in our work, the supplies weren't available to comply with the checklist. Right? As I know you all put central line cart. And the only way you find barriers is if you go look. Right? You go what the lean people would call go to the Gemba. But you go watch your clinicians trying to use that checklist and find out what's hard. But you go with an understanding heart, not a judging heart. You say, we assume you want to do what's right. Let's figure out what, what you're struggling for. And it may be a knowledge gap, but most often it might be, I don't agree with the evidence. And you need a conversation. It might be, I don't have the ability to comply with it because the supplies aren't there. Or it may be ambiguity, which our research team found out is the biggest barrier why clinicians don't use guidelines. What do I mean by that? is that if you read almost any policy from U U.S. hospitals, and then after reading it, ask yourself, could I walk away from that being behaviorally specific, knowing who's supposed to do what, where, when, and how? It doesn't happen. Because we haven't approached this with an engineer's mindset. An engineer would describe it in that detail. So you walk away saying, this is what I need to do. Most of our guidelines are at 30,000 foot level. So if you ask that bedside doc and nurse, who's really well attended, what does this mean for you? We just tested this approach, by the way, with CDC's Ebola guidance, where we had a program with them, because when we asked clinicians, what does the CDC's guidance mean? They were completely unclear. Not only unclear, they would do things that would put them at risk, in this case, potentially lethal risks. And so we simulated and made, made training that reduced that ambiguity. We next then need to measure performance and make sure clinicians get it back and then make, ensure all patients receive the, the evidence. Now, this is a generic model for translating evidence into practice. It's simple, but we use it for so many of our harms. But in this work, that unit level team is this CUSP team. And Brian was a CUSP executive. In our organization, the probably 90% of our units and you could define unit, nurse, unit as a nursing unit, is a lab unit. We have local microsystem improvement teams. Why? Because we know that the wisdom for how to improve is in the people. It's with the front line to do it. We just haven't created structures to tap into them. And so we form local teams. They, an executive adopts them. They work on local solutions. But they also then share them within a department and with a health uh, system. Now, a bit about the softer side of this stuff. You see, whenever you're leading large-scale implementation science, there is a technical component to the work. What's the evidence? What's the measurement? And that has to, you got to get that right. But ironically, that's why, not why most improvement projects fail. Indeed, if you look at the success of implementation science, about 85 to 95 percent of them fail. I mean, amazing amount of waste. And of those, 90 percent of them fail for what we'll call the adaptive side of work. It's a conversation Brian and I had many times. Not the technical side, adaptive meaning how do I get people bought into this, right? How do I get that private practice doc who has no incentive to do this to care, or the night shift nurse who comes in and feels like this stuff's just being imposed on me, how do I get them bought in? And there's tools to do this just like there's tools for lean. Some of the tools that it's really important for you to be mindful of are 
continuously messaging around a common purpose and a key set of principles, right? We will eliminate bloodstream infections, or in our case now across Johns Hopkins Medicine, our purpose is to partner with patients and their loved ones to eliminate preventable harm, to continuously improve their experience and eliminate waste in healthcare. All that we do laserly focused on that. We need to recognize that change progresses at the speed of trust and, and trust is built when you do things with rather than to people, right? And that is perhaps the biggest message for you as leaders of this organization. So often we assume I'm right, you're wrong, I have the answers, I'm gonna make a checklist and give it to you. And it's never used. And most importantly, it doesn't fit the local context, right? Yes, you could be very clear in why we're doing something and in what we're doing, but you need to defer to local wisdom in how you go about doing that. Right? And when you start as a manager creating how solutions, you're dead because you will get it wrong. Matter of fact, this idea that when you're dealing with complex problems, the role of policymakers and leaders isn't to create a solution, it's to create that enabling infrastructure that allows the solution to emerge locally. You gotta be accountable for it, but create that network that people could, 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 could connect. In this, we need to strengthen the uh, supporters and reduce the uh, resistors, and in that, being very, very mindful of words. So there's what part of our transdisciplinary research we draw upon the political scientists and some fascinating work about why do people follow others, right? Whether it's Trump or Clinton or Bernie Sanders, right? it's, it's amazing science and we, especially of us as scientists, think that we're very logical. People follow us because of our principles and our, I mean, our ideas and our policies. And what the political scientist literature overwhelmingly shows is we are emotional animals. We follow people by how we feel. And those feelings are triggered often by single words. And then from those words and feelings, we select facts to improve how we, we, we feel. Let me give you an example of political science work. There's probably no more offensive word than control. Right? How many think you feel positive if I say, I wanna control you, right? It, no matter what it is, right? And, but we, whatever spectrum you're on, those of us who might oppose the, or try to reduce gun violence weren't smart enough to realize that and we accept the language of calling these efforts gun control, right? It will get no traction whatsoever. Why? Not because the policies might not make sense, because we emotionally get negative feelings for that word control, right? Nobody wants to be controlled. You could have called it schoolyard massacre, childhood death, whatever you want to call it, but you're not going to get traction calling things control because none of us want to be controlled. And you need to be very mindful. And Brian, I remember when we first started this work, we had some clinicians who would use the words, you know, Peter, we're just going to push out guidelines from our academic hospital to our community hospitals, right? And that word descent cringes to our community doctors. We would get no traction. And I would say, no, no, no we're not going to call it that. You can't message it that because it just, it got, gets no traction. And then finally, you need to create structures that allow that solution to emerge. You'll hear, and those are structures that connect peers horizontally and vertically for uh, accountability. And we call that a fractal model, and I'll share with you in a couple minutes. So we felt kind of good about leveraging this one harm until I had to look in the eyes of the mother of another who lost a child who came up to me and said, Peter, why is it fair that you can tell Sorrel King that her daughter's less likely to die now and my daughter died a week after Sorrel did. She died at a California hospital, not at Hopkins. And she's just as likely to die today as she was then. She died, and if we have any engineers in the room, of respiratory depression after elective orthopedic surgery at the age of 12, while narcotics infused into her, as you all know, a known side effect of slowing your breathing, a monitor that counts your breathing, but oops, those two monitors don't talk to each other, in large part because we as leaders bought 
monitors that allow them not to talk to each other. And we accepted that as they're kind of, because they own the data. And so we have a system that still is killing little girls. We walked away from that, I walked away from that conversation saying, you know, I think we're thinking about this all wrong. We can't think about safety as playing whack-a-mole, working on CAUTI and CLABSI and UTI. We need to design a system that eliminates all harms, right? A bold move, and how would we do that? Well, turns out the oil and gas industry and nuclear industry have pretty mature systems to do that. They call them operating management systems. We've just never packaged it together. And so we created the Armstrong Institute to say, could we do that across Johns Hopkins Medicine? As I mentioned, it is laserly, laserly focused on a purpose of eliminating harm, continuously improving outcomes and experience, and eliminating waste. And every communication begins with this. And it's guided by some very perhaps surprising principles of how we will behave. And they are that I am humble and curious, I respect, appreciate, and help others, and I'm accountable to continuously improve myself, my organization, and my community. Because I found that words like excellence and discovery are way down the road, and if you're not humble and curious, you're not supporting your teams, we're never going to get to that end game. So the first thing we said was we need a governance system that functions like finance. I was talking to one of your board system. What, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at your organization, you're really complex. I think Brian was telling me you have over 300 care sites. We have about the same in our organization. And yet somehow our finance folks seem to have a consolidated financial statement that gets the dollars and cents from all those places and it rolls up to one board consolidated financial statement. We said, could we say the same thing about the oversight for quality and safety anywhere it's delivered in our health system? Now, we report, by the way, in our home care and hospitals and ACOs about 1,200 measures, so it's messy. But our answer was, are you crazy? Not even close. So we said, well, we need to. And we broke the delivery system down into these Buckets. You don't have to agree with them. It was a way to assign some rationale to it. We assigned a chief quality officer for every one of those buckets, and their charge was to create that enabling structure to allow solutions to emerge. So, for example, our ambulatory practices chief quality officer, Steve Kravitz, we have you know three or four more groups that deliver ambulatory care that never talk to each other. There was literally no forum for quality and safety and said, Steve, you need a table that everywhere we deliver ambulatory care, they need a seat at the table to co-create these solutions, and you need to agree on a standard dashboard that you will report up to your board. Right? Didn't micromanage, no formal authority, all through trust building. We did the same thing. We had eight ambulatory surgery centers that never talked to each other. Right? I mean, amazingly, right? And so, okay, here's a chief quality officer. Get together. I'm not telling you what your measures are but you need measures of quality and safety. I will sh share with you the bucket, and you need to report up to the board, and everyone needs a seat at the table, so we build trust and you learn from each other. And this didn't happen overnight. It probably took us about a year to do this. And we had this leadership philosophy of what we call shared leadership accountability, and this is really, really key. You see, there's, in my view, an enormous leadership gap in healthcare, and we generally have two types of leadership. One is we have leaders who believe their job is to provide the hotel functions for hospitals or health systems, and you leave it to the medical staff. So when your infection rates are high, or your HCAP scores are low, or your HEDIS scores are low, okay, Dr. Smith, you, I know you're trying hard. Keep, keep going, but, uh, you know, Half our patients are still not feeling disrespected. In other words, there's no accountability. On the other hand, we have shaming, where I'll never forget where we had a department chair at our hospital who got called to the woodshed for having a high infection rates, but we weren't supporting him at the time. And he pulled me aside and said, Peter, help me. Don't whip me. I don't want these infections, but I'm a surgeon. I don't know how to improve them. Help me overcome it. And what we've created is this model of shared leadership accountability, which, which I won't bore you with the leadership science, but what it simply means is that as a leader, a higher level in the organization could only hold a lower level accountable 
if they first hold themselves accountable to answering the question, did I maximally set you up to be successful? Right? It's a tough question. What do I mean by that? That means, does that person know the goals and get the measures? Do they have the skills to do this work in healthcare? That answer is often no. Most of us weren't trained in this. Do they have the resources and the time to do this? And if those answers are no, then the question says to higher level leader, is it really important? And it, maybe the answer is no, is the measure just bad or we don't have bandwidth for it? But if it is an important measure, then it's your job to commit the resources and to make sure that you, you deliver on that promise. And if you do that, kind of then the next lower level, there's no wiggle room, right? You have to deliver on this performance. But creating that alignment where we're, we have shared leadership accountability is really key. We use this tool to create this model of finance that we call the management discussion and, and analysis. It came from one of our board members said, you know, Peter, this stuff is really tricky. And if you read the financial report of any company, there's both quantitative and qualitative data. In other words, you can annotate. It's not just about the data. It's about what am I doing about it, interpreting it. So we use that and all those different delivery systems, actually it cascades down to the different regions, the different departments, all use this tool called the management discussion and analysis. We break reporting into five categories now. Safety, which is our, what their internal risks are. Performance on external measures, patient experience value, and healthcare equity. The measures vary while whether on primary care or home care or hospital, but they all have to use those same categories. Otherwise, we have no hope of consolidating them. And they have both empiric data and uh, contextual data. And we use this idea of a fractal. It's fractals you may know are this eloquent structure in nature. Uh, trees are fractal, ferns are nature, snowflakes are nature. But what they do is they provide that structure to allow solutions to emerge. That is, they allowed you to connect peers to learn from each other, so horizontal learning and vertical. And the way we've been modeling this, and it's flexible enough to your health system, is every higher level in the organization has to create a table where every lower level sits to co-create the solutions. Right, that fractals work by simple rules, and that's our simple rule. Now, our primary care doc said, Peter, we can't possibly do that. We have 80 primary care sites. My response was, then create another branch on the tree, right? Create regions. So now we have regions, and then the regions then create individual practice. But the point is, we need to create a structure that allows us to engage people from board to bedside, and that's how we aligned our ambulatory surgery centers, our home care, we had three or now five different companies, same thing. You don't need formal authority. None of this happens by reporting structures. It's simply you need a table to create this learning and to, to report up, and it's been a great metaphor. I m mentioned to you how we align this work into five categories. I, it's evolving, so we still debate is population health a sixth category as it go into the measures of value. Part of it, it's what's under my rubric, and it's a different piece, so right now. And then we had to break down the silos of all the work that's needed to lead this. So lean uh, training, so we call it learning and development, our analytics team, our marketing and communication to declare those messages, our strategic partnerships and our research all aligned to drive this, this really key work. I want to end with a few examples of how we drove this in very concrete and practical terms for you. I mentioned in our Clabsy work, the magic sauce was these clinical communities, peer learning from each other. So we said, could we replicate that in our health system? So we launched now over 40 clinical communities. They're all co-led intentionally by an academic and a community physician. At first, our academics got clinicians only wanted to do it and it was disrespectful of our community divisions who are smart, who are great clinicians. And we had some academic clinicians who said, but Peter, I'm the world's expert in spine surgery. Why do I need a cl clinical community or a community co-lead? And I said, because this isn't about you. This is about improving care in our health system, and you will fail because of that adaptive failure if you don't have a community co-lead. So if you don't want a clinical co-lead, I'm happy to get a new academic division, but you're not doing it with, without one, right? And those discussions weren't easy. 
and some of them are organized around service line. Some of them are around geographic areas, like all of our ICUs in our system. Uh, some of them are, are PACUs. Some are just topics, patient-centered care, pastoral care. There's no magic. The institute supports them with that enabling infrastructure, so project management, analytics, training, but they're led by clinicians, and their only charge is to achieve our purpose. They select what's it, we trust that they know what are the right measures, and they work on it. Here's some examples, you know, our transfusions across our health system that down significantly. But here's perhaps the greatest example of these peer communications. I don't know if there's any orthopedic surgeons in the room. Our orthopods were way over transfusing people, and they may not have been aware of the data. And we tried to change that for quite a while, doing it to them rather than with them, and no practice changed. We simply connected the transfusion clinical community and the hip and knee replacement and say, could you guys go talk to each other? I think this community has some knowledge that you don't have. And poof, you can see overnight, the orthopod stopped tr transfusion because it was this peer-to-peer -peer learning that we simply created the structure to support. We also, in this, we partnered with our supply chain folks because, as you all know, huge opportunity to drive down costs by supply chain. But most of those improvements aren't from negotiating better contracts. Yeah, that's 15%. It's from what the doctors and the clinicians use, but the docs don't want to hear from the finance people. Matter of fact, they get turned off. So I partnered with our CFO and said, okay, I'll partner with you on supply chain as long as you agree to two principles. Number one, physician choice will be maintained. I'm not going in to tell them you have to change this because I'll break trust. But they'll make that choice fully aware of what's on the table. And two, they get a piece of the savings, not in their pocket, but on registries or better data for quality so they can show how good they are to improve, consistent with Stark and anti-kickback laws. We've driven now $50 million out of supply chain costs. Here's an example of our hip and knee replacements. The community guy said, well, I'm, if you tell me to not use this right hip, I'm going to go to a competitor. And these are voluntary medical staff. We said, no one's telling you, but here's the deal. If you guys could agree, here there's several million dollar savings, you get 10% of it, it goes for registries, and if you do that, we'll then go market that your outcomes are good, and we've got great alignment with our clinicians. Same thing with our spine surgeons. That We started this ERAS pr program, right? They were telling a story, when you operate on the colon, you get infected because there's stool in there. We said, no, no, let's tell a new story, and our infection rates are down. Not only that, but their age caps are up, their uh, cost is down, but perhaps most exciting is the general surgeons aren't the only one who operate on the colon, our GYN and surgeons, but those two groups of surgeons never talk to each other. They're in a different tribe, so we, again, connected this peer learning community and said, I'm not telling you what to do, but I think one of you has some wisdom that the other might benefit from. Could you guys get together and share what you're doing, or woman, and overnight, the GYN on got the same infection rates down from this peer learning community. So what did we learn from all of this? Well, we learned that the secret sauce of improvement is believing and belonging. And if you ever doubt the power of believing, remember the story of Bannister breaking the four-minute mile. You, you, in 1956, when Bannister, as a medical student at Oxford, went to break the four-minute mile, leading scientists at the time said he was nuts that he would die trying, that it was impossible to run that fast. Well, he didn't die, and he broke the record. And that story is told in a great book and movie. But what you may not know is the next year, this 2,000-year-old record was broken by 12 more people. The next year, broken by 156 people. And now, high school kids in New Jersey are breaking the four-minute mile, right? And what changed? Nothing other than the belief. But ultimately, I think we learned what Don Abedian taught us, that the secret of quality is love. Right? And by love, we don't mean a 50-year marriage. Love, according to the psychologist Barbara Friedrichsen, who studies the science of love, found that love is micro-moments of positive resonance, micro-moments of positive connections, where I feel warm towards you, and you feel warm towards me, and we resonate. 
So it's that gentle smile to a worried patient. It's that arm around a colleague who just made a mistake. It's the respectful smile for a homeless person. It's that nice job to the environmental service perk worker who's scrubbing the floors and no one even acknowledges them when they walk by. You see, we learned that a big change is the sum of a thousand small ones. And those small changes are facilitated by a thousand micro moments. Change progresses at the speed of trust. And these micro moments are those secret sauce of building trust. So as you leave here today, I would hope you reflect on how you're going to answer Sorrel King's question, is Josie just likely to die, less likely to die? Because she wasn't just asking me, she's asking every one of us. And I completely believe that your health system can give her an answer. So please complete your I will statement. And I thank you, and I'm happy to take questions or comments. Sure, a question up there. And so my comment is I've been able to speak with other executives from Johns Hopkins about patient experience through an introduction through Press Ganey. They really recommended Language of Caring, mm -hmm. which is Wendy Lebov's program, and showed data about how Hopkins improved their scores. To me, Language of Caring is what we need right now to create more of what you just said. I was getting a neck ache nodding, micro moments of caring. It's exactly the respect, right. it's the courtesy, it's the listening and explaining the empathy, the heart, head, heart sandwich, right. if you will. With all of your wonderful quality work, did you interact with the Hopkins people? Are you familiar with language of caring? Any thoughts on that program? Yes, yeah, so great, great question. And let me share with you a little bit about our journey. When we formed the Armstrong Institute, uh, patient experience wasn't under quality and safety. It was completely separate, and it was largely about feeding back data. When we formed it, it got moved under uh, reporting up to me, so at least Alan's our chief patient experience officer. But most importantly, it got mainstreamed to say, hey, this experience isn't a nice thing over there. It's as rigorous as a bloodstream infection. And guess what, folks? We're going to apply it the same discipline and rigor as we do for all this other implementation science. And when we first started, Brian could probably know, we literally had some hospital presidents who said, yeah, but Peter, our scores are low because we treat rich patients. And pulled them aside and said, here's Greenwich Hospital, here's Stanford, uh, California, their scores are much better than ours. So you either convince me that it's because your patients are rich or next time I expect you to publicly message that you're on board because you're signaling to your staff. So we, we align this. We do use the language of caring, and I think it's a great program. What I would encourage you, though, is just like I don't think the magic was in our checklist. The, you need a tool to train to do it, but what's most powerful is getting that message to the bedside. And if we do high-level training and think it's somehow going to reflect automatically changing behaviors at the bedside, it's... I think it, there's a big gap between that. So what might be some other things that, that you, you can do? I'll, I'll share with you an example, one of the things that we did you may consider. We uh, have patient family advisory councils, as I suspect you do it, but I, the woman who runs our grievances program, I said, you know, we treat these as one-off letters, but there's wisdom in there. Could you go through the grievances and call out the top 10 list of what patients want from us? And let's share that with our organization and our staff and it went viral I mean it was silly things like don't lose my stuff keep my you know keep be quiet at night respect me treat my pain but it was so real you know what I mean and so we we use the training but I think we have to do uh, supplement it I also believe as an organization we need to be much more comfortable telling stories I'm all for data my PhD is in data but the juice of this work is touching people's heart, right? It's, it's, 
it's, I kind of say the stories of the heart inspires and the data validates. Hold me accountable for the data. I got to drive experience and that's measured in HCAPs, but I got to connect, uh, w w you know, w with people. And so I think language and caring is great, but it needs to be part of an overall uh, implementation program. We also, in our big organizations, I think you need to cascade this down. So we could only do so much centrally, but in that fractal model, our department chairs now have to report on their patient experience scores just like they report SSI, right? They wigged. I mean, what do you mean I got that? Isn't that what nursing does or that patient experience person does? No, no, I get it. It's part of your this management and discussion. You, you got to report it as one, of your, as one of your pillars. And there are a whole lot of excuses, but I, you know, I'll give you an example. Literally just the last two quarters, our neur neurosciences scores were terrible. And our chair of neurosurgery and neurology weren't super engaged. And they got called in front of the board to take this shared leadership accountability. We're giving you the data, we're supporting you. You gotta own it. They started doing rounds where they would go ask patients what they're doing, but whatever glitch they found, they would go back and improve and their scores went up like 8%. So um, happy to talk further, but uh, it definitely is p powerful. Other questions or comments? Thank you, wonderful talk. Um, last month we had um, uh, Brian Sexton from sure, Duke yeah. talking about resilience and wellness. And the initial data that he presented was about uh, the correlation between burnout and poor outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you would speak to that. Yeah, so great question. There's uh, overwhelming data now that employee wellness and burnout treat, I mean, is linked to empiric outcomes, both economic and, and clinical. I don't know if you, you may have seen, there was a fascinating study in the NICU that was a simulation, but one rude comment from a doctor to a nurse, one, and I don't know about your organization, but there's probably 50 of those a day, made them four times more likely to make an error for the next eight hours. I mean, it is profound about how these cultures of disrespect are really, really dangerous. and. I think part of the reason is, and no offense to the Joint Commission, but they missed the boat, I think, on their high reliability organization in some ways. When you look at ultra safe organizations, these ones that are highly reliable, they operate by two mental models. They standardize work whenever they could, so that's the lean or whatever you choose it, and we need to do that. But they also recognize that in complex patients and diseases, you can never standardize everything because we can't anticipate it and you need to recover. And that recover comes from having resilient staff who are flexible, who trust each other, who could know when to deviate from a checklist and say, no, no, this is something different. I, you know, I, I, I need to, to start thinking in a different way and we haven't done that. So I, uh, you know, as part of our integrated operating management system that I told you we're working on, there's another pillar that is employee wellness. Again, I, politically I have to be sensitive because it doesn't fall under me and this isn't about uh, uh, taking control of things, but you can't view employee wellness as this thing over here like we did patient experience and think it's all going to, to fit together. There needs to be, in my view, accountability that how we treat each other and employee engagement is really, really key and, and, and Burnout amongst physicians and nurses is a huge, huge uh, issue that I think we, we need to address. You know, w one of the examples getting at that that you might be interested in, in exploring was profoundly powerful is in our safety work, uh, I'm, safety is our internal risks. And the reason why we focused on it is because when we look at 98% of what our organization focuses on is what we're paid for, all right, or what's reported publicly in the press. And I get it, I need to do that because that's my responsibility. But when I ask doctors and nurses, what are you most worried about? None of those things are on their list, right? I mean, like it's, it's, it's teamwork, it's operational efficiencies. And so we, on our dashboard, have a safety measure that is, has three categories or four categories. Who are risky patients? Who are risky providers? And yes, we have them. What are risky units and what are risky systems? Those things you get from air reporting. But the risky units 
analysis came out of, we had a tragic event where we had a physician who was doing deviant behavior. And the board asked, Peter, why the heck didn't we figure it out earlier? And there was overwhelming data from the UK that shows that units that score low on employee engagement, on patient satisfaction, and on safety culture have much higher mortality and cost than units that don't. In other words, they're sick units, but we've never proactively identified them. And so we sought to identify them, and we did that analysis, and four units scored very low. And we looked at the units to which departments they mapped to. So there was a GI endoscopy suite that goes to the Department of Medicine. And we were a little bit worried about how we're going to create accountability for that. And so I sent the Department of, of Medicine a letter that says, we're doing, we did this risky unit analysis, and I'm going to be publicly presenting the results to the board next month. And your unit was identified. I'd like to come and meet with you to see what you think about the data, but most importantly, to help you craft a story what you're going to say you're doing to improve it, because certainly the board's going to ask when they see your unit, and I want you to look like you're doing things, right? There's tension between a, you know, shared leadership accountability. And that was one of four. Every one of those leaders said, Peter, thanks for giving me cover. I knew I had an abusive leader who was who needed to something needed to be done, and I was afraid to act. I didn't have the cover, but you gave me the cover. When the board presentation, they all looked like heroes. And so, to your point, I think the link between those two is emerging. My sense is we need to start having employee wellness mainstream in our uh, our quality and safety, perhaps as another domain, and get over about its separate reporting system, but have it, and there's accountability for having what is our wellness in, in, in of our employees because the, the data is completely, completely overwhelming. So great question. Question over here. Yeah, completely. And I, I mean, pr the, probably the most exciting thing I'm worried about, or I'm, I'm working on, is integrating this into an operating management system. Right? And I know I use that terms, but we were whack-a-mole. You know, patient engagement was separate from grievances, from employee wellness. And as leaders, I think we need to start seeing how all of these fit together. And there's accountability for, for these things. And I, in our organization, there's no board or leadership accountability for employee and wellness right now. I mean, we maybe report employee engagement, but we don't do so well in it, and it doesn't go up. But it ought to be just as important as uh, bloodstream infections. And if we do poorly on it, again, this shared accountability ought to be applied. So I think you're spot on. And the trick is how do you integrate them into a cohesive whole? Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you.